and and the Beatles song was playing in the back of the speakers, we could hear it, and you could kind of hear Paul's bass. It was kind of muffly, and, and he was looking at Ringo was looking at me, and it, it almost kind of like, "Go ahead and ask me a question." Everybody else has. Go ahead. So I go, "Hey, man. So, so what was it like when you played with the Beatles and you'd play like Shea Stadium or something, and you couldn't hear Paul or any of the guys? Well, how could you hear Paul's bass?" He goes, "I never heard his bass. I just watched his ass." <laughs> <laughs> Hey, this is Party Like a Rockstar podcast, and I'm your host, Joel. Today's episode is brought to you by Misha's Kind Foods. They're an LA-based small business making the world's finest non-dairy cheese on the market today. They're lactose-free, paleo, keto, kosher, perev, and 100% vegan. If you like what you see, check out the next video. If you like this video, please subscribe and like by clicking the little round button on the bottom right. To learn more about me or our other guests on the show, go to joelrody.com. You can follow us on Twitter, Instagram, or TikTok. The handle is Joel Rohde. If you haven't already read my book, Memoir of a Rohde, it's now available through Amazon and paperback Kindle or as an audiobook. I hope you enjoy the show. Hey, Matt. Here's the story about my life. Um, no, sorry. <laughs> Ron, hey, buddy. What's up, dude? Long time. It's so weird. I haven't seen you in like 30 years, and then I turn, there you are, and I'm just acting like I just saw you yesterday, but it's like, <laughs> well, see, we just, we that's just how it's supposed to be of your beds. <laughs> oh, it's a rule. It's a written rule. It's a written rule. Anyway, let's get going. I'll introduce you guys and then we can have some fun. So Ron Wixo is my first guest. He's a drummer and he's toured with Cher, Foreigner, Richie Sambora, David Lee Roth, the Steve Miller Band, The Storm, CCR Revisited, Greg Raleigh, and player with Peter Beckett and Ron Moss. My there second guest is Matt. That was good. I was supposed to do it with more chutzpah. The uh, my pool guy, my buddy Todd. He's like, you gotta. He's like, you know, we do it some more enthusiasm. I'm like, all right, man. I'm on this shit, Todd. I'm on it. So we're add a few more names. Add a few more names to mine. So just a couple more. So I, I did. Like, it is. It's longer. <laughs> it's longer because I knew you were more fragile. I was trying to make. I was trying to make it better for you. Just throw in Coldplay, John Mayer, guys like that. Just whatever comes up. Well, I was it. just gonna say his brother is Greg Bissonette, and just leave it at that. Perfect. Well, that's the better <laughs> half. So there you go. That was gonna be the end. Was <laughs> Matt Bissonette is my second guest. He's a bass player, and he's worked with Ringo, Star, David Lee Roth, Jeff Lynn, and ELO, Joe Satriano. Joe Satriano, Joe Satriani, <laughs> Steve Perry, Maynard Ferguson, Brian Wilson, Julian now Lennon, Peter Frampton, Ty Tabor, Jason Becker, Steve Hunter, Rick Springfield, Boz Skaggs, and of course, Elton John. I say, of course, Elton John, because uh, my first guest was John Mann. So that's a- what I heard. I heard but, you know John. Yeah. He, he's a good guy. He's okay. <laughs> <laughs> Who lives, by the way, who lives, by the way, down the street from uh, Alex Van Halen, right? He can hear him practicing. Sometimes. He says, and then there's a guy actually from Florida who lives down the street from him, too. Yeah. Uh, my dog wants to say hi to everybody. So say hi if you get this out of the way. Hey, bud. Okay. Here we go. All right. <laughs> All right John, are they in Woodland Hills, John? Yeah. In, uh, his address is for, uh, uh, he lives on, uh, in, uh, <laughs> off of like uh wood lake area there and uh yeah and alex lives right up to the to the side there and he's like says he's driving drives his bike by or you know his, his uh, car by every day and get that crazy car driving by and stuff so it's pretty cool yeah it's good and cool. finish it off here just in case you don't give a shit about music i don't know why you'd be watching the podcast but if you prefer tv my friend matt here was on the song for the tv show friends which is Every lady's favorite damn show in the world. <laughs> well, we actually played all the bumper music. The, I, I don't know who's the band that did the Fred's theme song. Um, uh, the Rembrandts. I Rembrandt, think. yeah. They oh, did okay. that. And then I worked with a guy named Michael Scloth, who was married to the woman who created Friends. And we did all the music. Uh, Ron, did you, you did some of that too, right? I worked with Michael a little bit, but I don't think I did Friends. I remember playing the Friends cast party actually with Jay and Rocket. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, Brad so Pitt play was all the way. music in between scenes of ba 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 da ba, you know, little short little yeah. clips and stuff like that. So was it was a good great. party? Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was on the it was on the set. You know, we played at the Central Perk set. Oh, that's the coffee store they all go to. Yeah. 
Ah, uh, I don't know. I don't know. What, <laughs> big, big jump there. Central perk. I don't know. It's kind of. <laughs> uh, you, got, you got the hang with the stars there, Ron. You lucky guy. <clears throat> yeah, Brad Pitt was there. It was I was feeling inadequate. <laughs> <laughs> the problem with Brad Pitt is, did you guys ever watch that Bet Between Two Ferns episode with Zach Galifianakis? Mm -mm, he brings mm -mm. on Brad Pitt and he's just, he's so funny, man. And he calls him Bradley Pitts. He's getting his name wrong. So I keep hearing now, Bradley Pitts, Bradley Pitts. <laughs> but Bradley I, Pitts. <laughs> wow. I can stick with you. So a lot of the people on here watching are roadies. And I heard about your roadie, Matt which was this fella named Bud, who was a pretty good roadie who would, uh, he would work till 2 a.m. playing the drums and he would go get bread at 5 a.m., man, as, as the word on the street. Bud, my dad, Bud, who we're talking about, right? That, that would be the Bud. I, I've been told by Kevin Anderson, which is how mm -hmm. I know you, because I used to work at the Jungle Room when I was a kid and you and your brother used to come in for session work a lot wow and uh he told me there's two stories to, to get out of you although i don't know if i was supposed to mention his name it probably really hurts our our ratings oh. <laughs> did you ever do any work at the jungle room ron do you know uh, um brian reeves at all no i don't think i've been to that one no, but oh, i do know studio, bud great studio and great guys really really yes. cool place I, I did know bud though <laughs> awesome bud stories so the guy he would play it he would play till two obviously gigging and then he'd wake up three hours later because he delivered bread in Detroit or? Well, yeah, we grew up in Detroit and my dad was a jazz drummer and you know, great drummer. And he had his own casual bands and wedding, wedding bands and different things back in Detroit. And back in Detroit, you'd have like this place called Roma Hall. It would be like 10 rooms with 10 different weddings every weekend, Friday, Saturday night. We'd play like two. My dad, when I, I started playing bass pretty young, like 12 and he just started me working before I even knew how to play bass. He just stuck me on the gigs with him and his accordion player. And we've been playing all these uh, Hava Ligila songs and all these just different ethnic mm -hmm. songs for whatever the party was and whatever the wedding group was. And then um, us he, Jews love that song, by the way, love it, the winner. <laughs> and uh, so we uh, we worked a lot together. And um, did you negotiate your rate? Because I heard it's 50 bucks. It was $50 a gig. And he bought me a tux. And what I tell everybody is that. I go, dad, I don't even know what I'm doing with this bass. I don't even know. Cause he literally got me on a gig. He bought me a tuxedo the week after I started playing and goes, I gave you 50 bucks a night, two nights a week, two nights a week, Friday, Saturday. What did, what did Greg night, get? Did he get 50 bucks? He, he would just come and set up Greg's, my dad's drums. And whenever my dad didn't like playing the rock songs. So he would just point to Greg and Greg would come and play like smoke on the water or whatever song we're playing. And then we go back and sit there and Greg would just watch him. So we were all kind of, doing all these gigs at the, you know, when we're really young. And my dad's big thing to me was, I go, dad, I don't even know what I'm playing. What do I play? He goes, just listen, use your ears. And whenever I point to you, get me a beer from the bar. <laughs> and so, he, so yeah, he got me, you know, got us going doing it early. So when he and my mom moved out to California from Detroit in around 1991, something like that, he, my dad would show up at a session we'd be doing a session and he would just show up just to kind of hang out because we were always trying to hang out as much as we could and uh he saw jay rubin a uh, friend of ours was setting up his drums and my dad just goes hey so what's up with that thing why he jay brings you drums and stuff and and then does he get paid for that and he goes yeah he gets paid pretty well and he goes uh well, how much does he get paid for that? And I think, I think he said like, like sometimes like 400, 500 bucks, you know, for a session, bring it up, set it up, get sound. My dad goes, man, I want to do that. So right from then on, my dad was doing all of Greg's drums cartage, you know, and he would show up at these sessions and everybody would know him by name. So it'd be like, it was a big party. My mom and dad would show up and they, it was just like the first half hour of every session, we would just be sitting there talking about things about with bud and my my one favorite story is one my brother tells all the time was greg got called to work with david foster once and he greg was kind of nervous because he never really knew david at that time so he says to my dad he goes dad just you know set up the drums this isn't like we can hang out you know just set up and get out of there you know and he, my dad okay cool so greg shows up to the session at 10 o'clock and there's my dad sitting at the soundboard with david just kind of hanging and my dad and Greg's going, hey, dad, you know, come on, let's go. And then David Foster looks to Greg and goes, 
hey man i'm hanging with bud we're talking about hockey man you go get a cup of coffee <laughs> <laughs> did you set like, up the drum did you yeah, set yeah, up? Just, that would be better yeah, you go out there and get your sounds man i'm hanging with bud but he kind of became part of the landscape you know and he it was pretty great man it was, yeah, i miss him have great. you ever heard of uh, buddy rich run <laughs> uh yeah a couple times you yeah, tell me the buddy rich story man. tell me the buddy rich story Tell you the Buddy Rich story? <laughs> it's a Bud story with Buddy Rich. Do you know what? Do you know what I'm talking about? Oh no, I don't know that story. No, it's my mad. dad. My dad, Buddy. With your dad, Buddy Rich. Yeah, is it made up? What? It, what's the? Uh... Okay, so this was it then. The uh, the story that Kevin told me was that your dad ditched school to go see Buddy Rich. And that oh, you know what? Maybe Greg told him then. So your dad ditched school to go see Buddy Rich. And your grandma walked in there and pulled your dad by the ear all the way back out of there to send his dad, send his butt back to school. I kind of remember that, but I, he had so many crazy stories like that, that I don't doubt that that happened at all. I could totally picture this kid watching this great show and his mom coming in and oh. pulling him by the ear. Oh, right no. the well, my grand, my grandma was pretty nuts. So she, she was an amazing woman and she, she encouraged him to do everything. So she was like the cool mom so i can't maybe maybe he was struggling at school like we all do maybe he, he needed it at the time but i'm sure she was behind you know probably laughing about it but she was maybe crazy. kevin made it up as well too i don't know the liar maybe we should get him on the podcast guy yeah, all, all <laughs> to talk about is, is hockey hockey that'll be the whole damn podcast that he's a great hockey guy that guy detroit red wings that's, that's his right. whole life yeah that's it anyway you're talking about those wedding and bar mitzvah gigs i did a million of those in new york too yeah same thing 10 10 rooms at the, you know brides and bar mitzvah things going on at you know place there's a place called terrace on the park yeah which is in queens right by shea stadium yeah uh, you wow. know, now by city field and a bunch of places like that all over new york area and then we did them in in la casuals I remember I did one with you, Matt, and we were going up the elevator. I think it was at the Roosevelt Hotel or something. Right. And my, my hi hat clutch fell off and went down the that elevator. Thing, yeah. <laughs> you remember that? It was like, <laughs> clunk, clunk, clunk. <laughs> it's like, oh, great. Was that, was that before the gig or after the gig? It was on the way to the gig. Oh, man. Gig. And you figured it out. Couldn't even tell you didn't have a clutch for four hours. Pretty good. Yeah. I'm, maybe I found another one in my trap case or something. I can't remember. But <laughs> so. I remember doing those weddings with my dad in the old days in Detroit. And it was really tough. I mean, really rough crowds. And if they didn't like you, man, they would get all over you. But every night, not every night, but probably once a month, there'd be a fight where we're playing in the in the, the room. You know, they just start, you know, big guys would start beating the heck out of each other. And uh, we had a system set where as long as we got paid, we'd work it out where we'd try and get out of there while the fight's going on so when we're playing the last song and we're seeing the fight starting to happen it'd be like hi-hat hi-hat i'd walk out snare snare <laughs> kick drum kick drum and we would just have this we did it all the time i mean it was probably 50 times it happened in our life and i put it in the car and we just take off because we got paid already and i remember the last gig i did with my dad in detroit this big monstrous fight started and they were just beating the heck out of each other i mean even the the he was he was punching the wife on their wedding night right and Whoa. And, and you know snare drum hi-hat moving the stuff out like that and i look at my dad and he's walking out i go you good and he goes yeah and i looked over his shoulder and there was a guy hanging from a chandelier just bam 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 punching people and champagne <laughs> flying all over the place and i was like that was his last gig i ever did with him and wow. it was just like it was a tough town yeah you get out of there yeah. <laughs> sounds like new york new york i'm sure was in the picnic either oh well you know <laughs> we, i used to do like four or five of those gigs every weekend yeah. friday night saturday afternoon su saturday night sunday afternoons and i'd drive all over the place i remember sometimes having to you know get up on the shoulder of the long island expressway because it, it was a parking lot you know it was going to be late otherwise it was yeah. nuts I remember that being a rough neighborhood because i used to take my son to all the baseball parks and i remember going to shea and Jamaica, is it Jamaica? That it's, area? Well, Jamaica is in Queens, but that's not by Shea, but it's... Well, whatever yeah. that area is around Shea, I was going, that's pretty rough. I mean, that's it's pretty, pretty rough. rough. Some of those, some of those, yeah. As you're lucky, you're a big guy. You could just... <laughs> when Ron, when I, when Ron and I first met, had to be around 83, 
Yeah. All we would do is play baseball all day. We would just <laughs> go to the park and hit each other baseballs because that's kind of what we were like. Yeah, I like music, okay, but we really like baseball. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and now Matt's son is a double A baseball player. Hey, that's cool. Yeah, yeah. We're pretty cool. So far, so good. Yeah, uh -huh. that's awesome. That's we're all, that's aren't cool. all musicians and techs frust frustrated sports guys? I mean, a lot of softball, man. I hear a lot of softball stories. <laughs> yeah. I used to play. I used to play uh, out in LA with with uh, Neil Giraldo. He had a team that he sponsored, and it was called Los Cool Guys. Los Cool Guys, and later <laughs> became Elvis Club. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's I remember right. one time he got all over me because I didn't slide into the gate <laughs> or whatever, you know. And I was like, dude, I got a gig tonight. I can't afford to break my leg. <laughs> <laughs> I remember hearing stories about Neil and Myron and Grumbacher in the studio. Like when they, they tell me that when they recorded that song, all, all fired up that Neil and Myron had just beat the heck out of each other, punched each other about yeah. something and then went and played the track. And that's why they, they were proud of it sounding so angry and tough, you know? <laughs> and I didn't know Neil that much. And then when we play softball, softball all the time, I'd see how intense Neil was. And one time we were playing football. I don't know if you were there, Ron, or not, but we're playing at Balboa Park and uh, he, this friend of ours, went, uh, he was covering him and, and, and he went out for the pass and Neil kind of got knocked over and man, Neil just looked at him and goes, okay, same play right now. I'm taking you out, man. He just got right <laughs> in his face. I was like, man, I don't want to get on the wrong side of Neil on a football field, man. Oh yeah. Yeah. Pretty nuts. You remember, so when John was on, I asked him to, what are the craziest gigs you play, you know, the weirdest venues or whatever. And he was saying with Elton John, I don't know if you were there, so that's the question. So it was in it was in Russia. It was some very wealthy Russian guy, and they played on in a strip club. And John was like, you know, we had to get Elton John's uh, piano on the stage. He's like, so the stripper pole was like right there. And I'm I'm trying to do percussion. He's oh. like, it was it was just, that was like crazy. Game. Oh, you know what? Well, that might have been before I was in the band, but I remember some small corporate gigs we do in the really super small stages, and you just don't really play soft with Elton. Everything's pretty massive, you know? I mean, I mean, all the guitar players I've ever worked with from Steve Vai to Joe and, and guys that can play loud, I've never heard a volume as loud as Elton's monitors. And oh. the, the level that he gets is so loud that sometimes when we're on the road, we'll be sitting there uh, before the show and then the piano tuner will come out and everyone just sits and watches him as he goes out and he'll put his He'll put his tools on the piano and he'll kind of look around and he'll go like this. And everyone's just waiting for him to go toink, you know, like the Disney thing where he, da -da 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 -da, and the piano blows up. So he puts <laughs> his tools on the piano and he just goes, and they always from whatever, whoever he is from any city just jumps off the chair and look oh like, God. are you kidding me, man? That's the level that he plays at. So, um, yeah. So he's using floor monitors? He uses floor monitors. The whole band uses in-ears, except for Ray Cooper, uh, the percussionist. He uses wedges in the back. Elton uses the front monitors cranking. So funny. It's completely opposite. It was a Steve Miller thing. Everything is, everybody's on ears. Yeah. And the only live thing on stage, which isn't even on the stage, is the guitar amps. They're behind the scrim. Really? Uh, yeah, so so every, you don't see an amp on the stage on Steve's set. So how does that work, man? When you go to a show and everything's like that, like at church, when I go to church and the bands always sound great through the PA because it's because they do that, right? They you know they put the glass up on the drums and they they baffle the speakers or they put them off stage, and in here it sounds like a record. It yeah. sounds great and it sounds great coming from the cabinet. But when you're sitting in the front four rows. It's got to sound pretty weird, right? I mean, you're just... I, I was, I wonder what it sounds like on the stage. I can't tell what, what it sounds like on the stage because I have the ears in, but I imagine standing on the stage, it's got to sound really weird. It's and really... yeah, you're right. The front row, they, they must have some speaker coverage in the front, I guess. Yeah, it's almost like you got to put woofers down in front so they can feel it because it would just sound like a lounge gig because yeah. you're, you're hearing drums and you're, you're not, I mean, my bass is so soft on stage that you wouldn't feel it and you'd just be going, why am I sitting here, man? Why did I pay 400 bucks to sit in the front row yeah. when I'm not feeling it, you know? So, I mean, I, I, have to, I have to say, they must be feeling it on, on Miller's gig because they're all jumping up and down. Oh, like, man. you know, like so you got, so you have the coolest gig in the world, man. Steve Miller, that music, if you don't like Steve Miller music, you're crazy. <laughs> I mean, the first concert I went to Santa Barbara bowl, great place to see a show too. Yeah. Oh yeah. 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 With, yeah. With, uh, I read he, uh, 
I read a long time ago, but he he wrote the Joker like on the front of a car because the party sucked and they went outside and they wrote the Joker sitting on somebody's Chevy uh, or something. I, I don't know. I have no <laughs> idea. Look <laughs> it up because I guy. think that's true. I'm the new guy. I've only been in the band for a couple months now, but everybody else has been there, you know, 30 or 40 years. You know? Ron's still got new guy smell going on. <laughs> yeah, when I saw him and we're talking in 98, I think, he had like a rapper guy come out and rap to Fly Like an Eagle. Do they still do that? Mm -mm. Hmm. No rapper guy. It's just Steve. But Steve, you know, Steve is, he's singing, from what I understand, he's singing everything in the original keys, you know, and he, I mean, he's no spring chicken anymore, you know, so yeah, that's pretty cool. I know most bands have, are tuning down by now. I don't know if Elton does that. That's, that's weird, man, because Steve and Elton and a lot, and a lot of those guys, Paul McCartney and guys, I mean, they just, they just don't want to change the keys, man. They want to do, I think we do two songs in down a half step or a whole step or something. Those are high songs for Elton, and I'm sure they're high for Steve too. I mean, to yeah. be doing that at, at their age, to be full bore singing, it's amazing. It, it makes yeah. you realize how wimpy we've become in the last 30 years. <laughs> like, isn't it weird too that, like, with the music that we grew up with, it was like guy vocals were like Sticks and Rush and Kansas, and yes, they were like up there. And then throughout time, it just kind of came down. And then girl singers started, you know, being really big and stuff. And, and then, it's like, like the range has dropped like a, an octave almost, you know? Yeah. They don't, we don't have any tracks either. It's all, I mean, it's all live. It's no, yeah. You know, there's no backing vocals on yeah. a sampler. There's the only thing that's on samplers is some of those sound effects, you know, but. How many guys sing with you guys? The, everybody else but me, although I may start singing. He asked me if I wanted to, but I, I you know, we only, I mean, I just jumped into this thing. We had no rehearsal. Yeah. And just you know, I just learned the songs at home. And you know, in fact, on the second gig, um, there was a song that we we had to do this live video. Uh, of, they recorded a video. They brought a film crew and the drone and all this stuff. We did this at Soundcheck for a, for some charity uh, in Nepal, I think it is. And so we did Fly Like an Eagle. But then the rest of the Soundcheck, we just kind of you know he likes to just play blues or whatever, you know? So he played a song, which I hadn't heard before, which was his song. It's called uh, Cow Cow Calculator. And it's kind of, it's a cool song from the sixties, but um, I hadn't really heard it. You know, I, I think I might've heard like once or something, but it wasn't on the list of stuff I was supposed to learn. So we just kind of, you know, muddied our way through it at Soundcheck and I didn't think anything of it. So then that night at the gig, <laughs> He goes, I think I'm going to change the set. Yeah. <laughs> and he, he pulls this song out. And I was like, what? I don't even know what song it was. And so he starts it. And the keyboard player, which is Joseph Wooten, um, he's, you could see him if you ever saw a video of it. You could see him over there, like giving me the bass drum pattern with his leg. And you know, so wow. we just kind of winged it. And But yeah. that's, you know, he kind of. I think he likes that he comes from the blues, you know, jamming thing. So nothing is like super structured. If he wants to go off and add a solo or something, he just does it. And yeah, when you've been doing, when you've been doing it that long, you probably just want to do different stuff and keep saying. Oh know? yeah, yeah, and, and you know, doing all those gigs that we used to do, all those casuals and all that stuff, is actually great for this because you know our blues club gigs or whatever. Because you you have to you know you really have to listen. You have to use your ears so you don't you know get stuck in the rut of, well, the, the chorus is next, not if he says it's not, <laughs> you know? Yeah, we're both fortunate to be working with guys that, that um, you know, guys from the 60s and 70s that when music was just kind of free and, you know, like the weirdest thing with Elton for me when I was learning all the songs was that there's odd bars uh, and phrases that happen that don't make a lot of sense when you, musically, when you hear it. And then when the first time I was in the studio with Elton, Bernie Toppin was in the next room and he, okay, let's do it. So Bernie will come and just stick a bunch of lyrics on the piano. And then Elton will just look at it and start writing to the words, right? I mean, who does that? That's, cr that's crazy, right? But well, yeah, it's amazing. When well, when you're writing to words, you don't, it doesn't, it, it, sometimes when we, when we all write, we're writing, you know, drum machine, write a thing and it's all four, four and it kind of makes sense and the phrases and, you know, but he writes these things to go with the words and it automatically takes time, you know, bars 
and, and beats out of the thing. So there's five, four bars all over the place. That was the hardest part for me, learning, having to learn, you know, three hours worth of music in a week and a half or whatever it was. Yeah. yeah. Those, those were the things that I was like, I just can't screw that up because that's like, there's a reason why there's a five, four bar to fit this one line. In. And so, uh, but we're lucky, we're, you know, we're very blessed to be working with these guys that are just, pioneer music that didn't have it wasn't like the structure of music like it is now where you know yeah, there was no rules yeah there's no rules and they just were free about it so it's pretty cool greg raleigh's the same way he's he, like he doesn't care what you know what the next chord is supposed to be he, yeah. he puts the one that he wants to put yeah down. exactly right. do you know who else writes to the words who? barry manilow really i don't know i write the words isn't that like his, his, uh, right. his, uh... i just played pickleball with ron pedley his uh piano player see and it is it's all these sports games now. you know well yeah that's that's it have you guys played pickleball yet oh man it's the greatest sport in the world uh my friend it's the only thing he'll talk about you could go oh, with him about it. within 15 minutes it's about pickleball he wants to start a pickleball magazine <laughs> he's, like, <laughs> he's going it's nuts. great it's awesome man it's awesome but yeah Bar you know barry's another guy singing all the songs that's in fact that's why i brought uh, that's why it was weird because we were talking about he does all the songs in original key you know i mean and that's not easy when you're 75 years old some of those songs you know i mean you were singing them in the studio you never know you're going to do them 50 years later you yeah. know half the songs that i write if i had to sing them in 10 years from now i couldn't do you know it's like it's very strange you know his bass player ian barry's uh, yeah. So his bass player's name is Ian and Ian is actually, so my sponsor is this cheese company. They, uh, and Ian's the guy who makes the cheese <laughs> and he's oh, wow. his bass player. I thought it was Larry and Tanina, but I, I think they, well, done... this guy, I don't know how long he was with them and whatnot. Um, but yep, he, he played with them and he, uh, so what is it again about cheese? So it's a, uh, they, they make a cheese. Oh God, I should have known it, it. So it's, it's, uh, <laughs> I used to read it in the beginning of the sessions and now I did it as a pre thing, but it's, uh, it's, it's not, there's no dairy in it and it's well, super, super good. I, I really genuinely like it, but they make a lox one. So I'd laugh, you know, I was like, Oh, I am, but it's the, the lox is actually made out of carrots. It's badass. So, really? yeah. So it's, you know, and then it fits what's like popular right now with a lot of, you know, keto and vegan and all these kind of things that people are really into, but, uh, it, it's nuts. It's nuts. And it tastes like cheese. It's really, really great. I love it. <laughs> Who thunk it? Who thunk it? Yeah, I don't know, but that was Ian. Ian made Somebody it up, man. It. Ian did. did. So, <laughs> yeah. So if it doesn't work out, he's going back to playing the bass on the, he's still gigging every now and then for fun. He's a really, really nice guy. Very, very quiet person. Like really, really quiet guy. Wow. Bass players are usually quieter than guitar players and drummers. Drummers, Ron is Ron is one one of the more mellow drummers that I know. I, yeah. And Ron's Ron because I think with Ron, not to you know embarrass you or anything, but there's I always think there's two different kind of drummers. There's the drummers that have so many chops that they just can't. If it's a session, it's a pop song, they just can't resist doing something. That is amazing, but it draws attention to themselves, you know, because it's something that they're they're musicians and they. It's because when you're a kid, it's the Muppets, man. It's animal. Yeah. You have the to. Animal. Yeah, it's just like, and 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 not and there and those drummers can do it when they want to, but they most of them don't really want to, and they don't really care because they don't want to be session guys. They want to be drum pioneers, right? And then there's drummers that can that could that can just play those things and play session stuff and really don't have the chops but ron's one of those guys that has those chops and can do it but he knows how to like the stuff that you always send me that you do in your studio it's always like great drum tracks and they're and they they are great for songwriters you know for singer songwriters you know you just can't pull away that crazy stuff in the middle of a song so and so ron's personality is a lot like his playing i think which is like kind of understated and he can kind of, you know, do all the stuff everybody else can do, but he, he'll like, if he has a drum solo, do you get a solo with Steve at all or? Not with Steve, but I've, I've done him with Greg Raleigh and, and uh, the CCR thing. I, I would never really thought of myself as a soloist like that. It is funny when you say draw attention to yourself. When I first met Greg, I was auditioning for the storm, which was a band that Steve Smith had just left. Right. And so here I am auditioning, Repl to replace Steve Smith, you know, who's like a drumming god to most people, you know, and uh, and you know, I, I wound up getting the gig, and later on, um, Greg's 
I, I, you know, he, he told me a, a couple of things. One of the things we had to do was play Black Magic Woman, which he sang in Santana. You know, that's him on lead vocals in the original Santana band. And, uh, but there was no percussion. So we had to kind of try to make something up to, to you know, kind of emulate all of that activity that, that's on, especially on the Gypsy Queen part of, of the this, this song. And so a lot of rock guys didn't really know how to do that, you know, so, so he, that kind of turned him up. But then he told me the main thing that he liked when, when he decided, when they decided to ask me to join the band was that when we were playing the, just the, you know, the straight ahead rock pop tunes, I never did anything while he was singing that made him go like, you know, yeah. like, what was that? <laughs> you know, which is basically what you're talking about, you know, when, when you, yeah, man. I mean, I, I, when I, when I sing in bands and I, you know, like you cover get big gigs or whatever, and somebody steps on your vocal. I mean, you know, I'm playing gigs all the time on bass and I'm trying to be, trying to figure that out to the same thing you're talking about. But when I'm singing and somebody does something like that, I'm like, are you kidding me, man? What, what, <laughs> why, why did you do that? And then I think about guys like Elton or, you know, Greg and you know Raleigh and stuff. And it's like, yeah, I mean, but that's the thing though. You, you could fill up that space in Black Magic Marker with, with your Latin stuff that you do by just playing busier because you're covering for no percussion, right? And that's like music vocabulary. Greg, my brother always talks about music vocabulary and that's knowing that you don't have a percussionist and you have to fill that space up. If you didn't have the chops to do that, it would just, it wouldn't be good, right? But you can go and all that stuff and fill up stuff with your hi-hat and more toms and cymbals and stuff that can emulate percussion unit you know and yep. some guys don't have that facility to do that you know so that's what i'm saying it's like that's my whole point of that is that you can pull that out of your hat and a lot of guys you know, cosmo when cosmo was on here that's what he told me he said that he would watch ron to take notes <laughs> that's cosmo, why cosmo man i was so grateful to him for asking me to so you know he's an another iconic guy he did you know, he's not a chops guy, but he did everything that you needed to do to give CCR the sound that it had. You know, he that swampy, what I don't even know what you call it. Some people call it garage rock or whatever, but you know, he just had him and Stu had that feel with Fogarty and the and the vocals. And when he asked me to do that, I was like, man, <laughs> you sure I'm the right guy? But you know, it worked out great and and uh and he was really, really just couldn't have been nicer and couldn't have been more supportive. He was such a good he guy. Had, he had this great story where he, he said that he, uh, it was down on the corner and he said he took it, he took the song and he had to come up with the drums for it. And he said, he's yeah. at home and he laid them out on the floor, like the different tracks or something he was saying. And he's like, he, it was like days. He put so much time into figuring out this song and he really hoped that Fogarty liked it. You know, and then he and then he did it, and he goes, you know, it's so funny, is it's like it's the easiest damn song to play, and it took me so long to figure out. But then I had somebody else on here, and they're like, it's not that easy. <laughs> so you know, there's one thing about something being easy to play, but there's another thing about being the guy who came up with it. You know, too true, and, and invented it. You know, I mean, if if the, if it wasn't invented the way it was, you know, we can all copy it probably, but but you had to think of that and that's what gives it the feel and the character that it has yeah you know? what was the other one it was uh there's a he's all as the drummer you just see butts <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's true that was my one ringo story when i we were playing with ringo one time and we were doing a show and we're walking and everybody's always asking ringo questions like hey man what was it like when you played chase State? you know whatever and, and i was like man i'm not gonna be that guy i don't want to be you know that guy asking him questions and then we're walking up one day to and and the Beatles song was playing in the back of the speakers we could hear it and you could kind of hear Paul's bass it was kind of muffly and, and he was looking at Ringo was looking at me and it, it almost kind of like go ahead and ask me a question everybody else has go ahead so I go hey man so so what was it like when you played with the Beatles and you'd play like Shea Stadium or something and you couldn't hear Paul or any of the guys well how could you hear Paul's bass he goes I never heard his bass I just watched his ass <laughs> You're just like yeah i mean that's that's the guy right there man that's the story but here's a if, fun one so when john was on he had said you know meeting ringo was like oh shit you know and uh one of the biggies he mentioned was sting when sting would come and he'd just sit right next to him and like watch yeah, him he's yeah. like fuck you know and sting 
If, who are the guys that you guys have seen while gigging where you're like, oh my God, he's like staring right at me. And, you know, it's. When I was in a David Lee Roth band, we played, um, this was after Matt. Unfortunately, Matt and I were not in that band at the same time. I always wished I'd gotten to do that with him. But uh, anyway, uh, we were in London. We had toured, uh, uh, we'd done some US stuff in Japan and we went to England and, and Jason Bonham's band was the opening band on that. It was a band called Motherload, I think. And uh, we played, I think it was Hammersmith, some, one of those places. And um, Jimmy Page was there because he was, uh, you know, new Jason, obviously. And, and, and Brett Tuggle, who Matt is good pals with too, he, he had played with Coverdale Page not long before that. So Jimmy was sitting at the monitor station the entire gig. <laughs> I just kept looking over there going, holy crap, that's Jimmy Page. <laughs> you know? Yeah, it's just like, you know, I mean, as a drummer, I grew up, you know, the John Bonham thing was huge, you know, I mean, just listen to that stuff constantly. And, and just to look over there and see Jimmy Page sitting there, I just was like, this is surreal. What's the weirdest thing for me is when people, famous people or people that you look, look up to are sitting at the side of the stage watching you. Um, you automatically think about it must sound so bad on the side of the stage because yeah. you're not getting any, you don't know what they're hearing. Like James Taylor was, we played a gig with, with Elton in Brazil and he was opening up and he was just sitting on a couch, you know, and listening to us. And I'm just going, man, you know, go out front, you know, go out front and hear it, you know. But that's when you realize, man, I mean, talking about techs and talking about the guys that really make the whole thing happen. I think every band is is a, just a really good garage band when it comes down to it. You know, I mean, sounds great, everything it is, but like with Elton's band and a lot of bands I've worked with, something happens from what that group group sounds like at Leeds or practicing at you know wherever you're practicing. It just sounds like any band, and you know, really good bands and the songs are great, but. The magic is what happens when it goes out there, man. It's like it's like a whole other thing, and I have to remember that sometimes, because I'm feeling like like responsible if it doesn't sound good from what I'm hearing, or you know. And my my one was uh, when I was with uh, Maynard Ferguson, and I was like 19 years old, and and we played at the Hollywood Bowl, and I looked down the front row, and there's Stanley Clark in the front oh row, gosh. oh man, <laughs> sitting next to Barbie Benton. Remember the Playboy girl, whatever, the Playboy bunny girl? And they're both, you know, I'm like 19 years old, new to Los Angeles and just looking and, and seeing Stanley who had just produced El, uh, Maynard's last record. And I'm going, what am I doing here, man? What, what yeah. you know, I just yeah. like, so, you know, and uh, yeah, it gets pretty intimidating. And I, I think I get more nervous when I have to play and sing in a small club in front of my friends than I am. Yeah. When I play in front of a million people I don't know, you know? Yeah, like when your brother walks in and I'm playing drums, I'm like, holy crap. <laughs> One time Vinny walked in, I was doing a lounge gig in, in Burbank across from NBC Studios at uh, a place called Chadney's. Oh, yeah. Just with, you know, a singer and a keyboard player and a bass player. And Vinny Kaliuta came in. I'm like, yeah. of all the gigs you, you had to come to, you had to pick this one, huh? Right. <laughs> There's like four people in there, you know? And, you know, you he's drum, like the greatest you, drummer on earth, you know. You drummers got are like uh, the brotherhood, though, man. It's kind of you guys kind of all support each other, I think, more than other other groups. Yeah, you know, drummers definitely, you know, definitely have a. I don't know what your you, brotherhood is a good word for it. I guess. Yeah, I've but, noticed that over the years. I mean, it's always like you guys are. Not to say that you guys are like, uh, you know, recommending each other for every gig and, you know, going, you know, to the mat. But I think it's like, I think out of all, I think bass players kind of the same thing, maybe pretty mellow, but drummers always seem to me like you guys always would like to learn from each other more than yeah. like guitar players and stuff, you know, mm -hmm. like, like Eddie Van Halen would play with his back turned right to the crowd. Yeah. So they wouldn't see him doing the Alan Holdsworth or whatever and not nailing guitar players or anything. But I think that, uh, Bass players are mostly like kind of humble, kind of normal guys compared to, you know, some some guys. But they I think they kind of like to talk about their bases and share stuff like that. But I think drummers 
are always like trying to help each other out. Hey man, here's a Brazilian beat, man. Check this out. Yeah. Sit in the garage and jam. It seems like that to me, you know? Right. Yeah. Greg was, your brother was the one who recommended me for David Lee Roth, which yeah. I always was thought was really cool of him. And, and I had, you know, same things happened in other things with the storm, Pat Torpy and Mickey Curry and, and even Smith, cause he was leaving. He, all those guys put in a word for me, which was really cool, you know? Yeah. So when uh, you're doing the storm, so you're with Cher and then you're trying to do the storm thing. You're trying to do the share thing. You end up getting the gig. You take storm. Um, some certain things happen where I read basically the label kind of had moved on to grunge. You had written, you had said, and yeah. so because of that, you were a little late and then it's like, oh shit, but you didn't miss that much by the sound of it. Cause you were able to do the share show. So you didn't really miss out on anything in the end, but was your, were you nervous as all hell of what am I doing and what's going well, on? And so basically the way that happened was I was in Cher's band and we were getting ready to go to Europe. This was early 1992. And um, I got the call to, uh, to audition for the storm. So I went up and I auditioned for it and it, you know, it felt pretty good. And, and, uh, but I was still, you know, we were still in rehearsals with Cher. And then I got a call to go back and like do a call back. They had whittled it down to me and one other guy for this, for the storm thing. So I went back and I did the, uh, the second audition and I actually had, I flew, it was in San Francisco and Cher's rehearsals were in LA. So I flew up early in the morning, did this, the second audition and then flew back in time for Cher's rehearsal. I didn't want them to know that I was, you know, there was this other possibility, right? Well, so then they offered me the gig and I was a little bit torn because the gig with the storm was to be a band member, you know, was, so, so now you're a full participant in royalties and merch and all that stuff, as opposed to a share where you're just a hired guy, you know, a well-paid hired guy, but still, you know, when, when she decides to work, that's when you work. So anyway, long story short, I, I did obviously take the gig with, with the storm and, uh, and, you know, they had to get somebody to replace me for the Europe thing with Cher, but then she wasn't, I don't know what happened, but she decided that she wasn't really thrilled with that. And they called me when we were still on the tour with Brian Adams and, and asked uh, if I could do these other gigs that she had on the books. And it just so happened that her other gigs fell in between all the gigs that we had with the storm. So I was going in between both tours. I actually got a Christmas card from Rocket Cargo at the end of the year. And the guy, <laughs> the guy sent me a, he drew a map of the United States and he put like lines all over and, you know, I said, hi, this is Ron. I need my gear. And, you know, and like, cause it, it, they were shipping it back and forth in between both tours. You know, it just was very lucky that it yeah. worked out that way. And then later we did, um, we did a, the, the next record with the storm. And then it was after that, that the whole thing happened where, you know, they turned into a grunge label. It was Interscope Records. And, uh, you know, they just didn't support the record. We did eventually get that record back and we didn't have to pay for the masters, which it was like a quarter of a million dollar record to make. Oh, um, but, and they just gave it to us, which was really cool. And yeah, we did yeah. release it on a couple of smaller labels in different territories. Um, but, you know, it just the band was basically over by then. Anyway. It's online. I listened to it. So people can yeah. listen to it on Spotify if they want. Yeah, it's out there. I think everything's out there, but yeah. <laughs> it's there. I thought yeah. it was really good. And then um, I love the audition for Cher's stuff. That was that was really entertaining. I mean, were you really that tough to her or did you? The second you... one. Yeah, yeah, because, yeah, yeah. Right. You because... know this stuff, Matt? Do you know, where, do you know what I'm talking about or? I don't know, but I have. Okay, a this is entertaining, I think. Well, so, okay. So I, when I first got the gig with Cher, it was 1989. And there was like six auditions. It was just like a cattle call. It was like a hundred guys on every instrument auditioning for the gig. And uh, I wound up getting the gig after like six callbacks. And so we did, you know, the rest of the stuff that year. And then we did an entire tour in 1990, all over the world, made a TV show, which turned into a DVD and all this stuff, you know. And the TV show aired the next year, which was uh, spring of 1991. And so then I, I, I heard through the grapevine that there was like, she was gonna she was gonna go back out, but she was putting a new band together. Like all the other guys weren't in the band anymore, so, <laughs> including me. So I thought, well, I guess I, I guess that's not my gig anymore, you know. So um, 
Dave Amato, who's a really good friend and had played with me in the band, uh, he happened to be down at the complex in West LA where they were doing these auditions and, and he ran into her there and he, he goes, what are you doing? Why, why are you getting a whole new band? Your band was great, you know? And uh, so, so the next day her office called me and her, uh, her, uh, she had this, her manager had this assistant, her name was Ruth. She calls me up and says, Hey Ron, you know, and I knew her because she, she had been on the tour with us. She goes, hey, Ron, I, you know, I wanted to, Cher wants to know if you'd be willing to come down or something, you know, and like she didn't want to say it. She goes, and I said, what does she want? She wants me to come down to, for what? To, to audition again? <laughs> I said, I said, why don't you tell her to watch a TV show that was on last week, <laughs> you know? And so I was kind of pissed, you know, and so and, but I needed the gig. I needed the work, you know, because I wasn't doing anything else that paid that good at the time. So Dave spent the entire weekend trying to convince me to go to this audition the next Monday. And I was like, no way. I, I, screw that. You know, <laughs> so he finally talks me into it because, you know, he knows I need the gig, too. And so I went down there and I knew the way she did her auditions. She took Polaroids of everybody and had like this sheet, you know, you filled out your horoscope or whatever, <laughs> you know. And so I brought I brought like a, an eight by 10 of myself with me. And when they called me in to play, she was sitting at this table with her, you know, her, with her entourage and had her sunglasses on. And I just walked up to the table and I put the eight by 10 down and I said, here, just in case you forgot what I look like. <laughs> and I walked over and started, we started playing. And I was just, when I was playing, I was just like, <laughs> I was just like slamming. And you know, I, I just was like, I had this weird attitude because of the way this had yeah. happened. Anyway, long story short, she she wound up rehiring me, and it wasn't just me. There was a couple of other guys, a keyboard player, I think. Um, and and Dave was playing at that point, so, and he's like laughing at this whole thing. You know? So they wound up rehiring us, and and uh, then she was super nice at that point. She had this she had this red wig on, and. And I was like joking around with her, like, where'd you get that wig? You know, it looks like you got it at Kmart or, you know, I was just goofing with her, you know, and, and it, it all worked out in the end, but it was just like this strange, like, why do I have to audition? I just did like a year and a half, you know, like you should know me by now, you know. Weird but, business, isn't it? It's, it's uh, that, that's happened to me a couple of times too. And it's like, you know, it's yeah, it is, right? The head scratcher. <laughs> Well, I read here you did what they auditioned 45 drummers for Foreigner. Man. Like, yeah, it was something like that. <laughs> a, a hell of a lot of people, man. <laughs> yeah, and that was in New York. I had to fly out, out to New York for that one. They pay for your flight, though, I assume. Oh, yeah. 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 All right. So when I was first to put together uh, this podcast, I uh, was at my buddy's house. He has a daughter in fifth grade and she was with her girlfriends and they collectively came up with a good question. And the question was, when did you first feel famous? And they said, I need to ask that to every guest. So we're talking about little kids, but if you want to say when you first felt famous, that's cool. Or it could be when you were uh, on, on your path that there was a, there was a time in your life where there was a moment that meant something to you and pushed you forward but a, a moment worth mentioning, what would each of you choose as a, a defining time? Ron, I'll not go first. Oh, okay. Well, that's a great question. And I would kind of answer it backwards. Um, hmm. the, the word famous can mean a lot of different things. You know, you have like a, today's famous is kind of like a woman, you know, God bless her, Kim Kardashian. You know, she's probably a great person. I don't know, know her at all. She's probably a great woman. But uh, the business of being famous, I think the word has been hijacked. Be being on TV all the time where everybody worships you and, you know, all the glory and goes to them about how popular they are or YouTube people and how many likes they get and how that. So there's that kind of famous. And then there's... Uh, there's the thing that I think is more important that the, at the end of in my life, every time I've played with somebody that was famous and that I really liked, I'd find out within a couple of days that they're just normal people or maybe they were crazy.
but they were no happier or sadder than I was. Hmm. And I think the goal for being famous is, is, is contentment wherever you are. And, and, and because that's a, that's a bumpy road, especially for someone like her. How old did you say she was? Whatever fifth grade is. Uh... Fifth grade, yeah. Cause there's a lot of pressure on those kids to be famous. And, you know, that's a, my, my goal in life is to be famously unknown. Okay. Which means I want my friends to know me that they respect what I do and they think that I'm good at what I do. And when I go to their house to play on a record that I do a great job for them. And they, the goal is that they call me back because they like what I do. And if, if I can go on the road with Elton for 10 years, that must mean he likes what I'm doing and, or whatever band. So that's all I need is to know that I'm doing my job. As far as being famous, I wouldn't wish that on anybody because yeah. Every person I know that's famous, I don't think it turned out the way that they wanted it to when they started. I think it's like when I go out to dinner, like with Rick Springfield or something, like we're working on a record, we go out to dinner. Nine times out of 10, he's in the middle of a bite of food and somebody comes up, hey man, I saw you in General Hospital, man. And can you give me my autograph? And if he starts doing one and then more people come in and it's like his food's getting cold and you're just going, it's almost a curse in a way, you know? <laughs> so, I mean, the first time I started feeling like people knew, you know, I think we all get into music because um, number one, we like it. And also it's a good thing because our peers respect it. It's like being an athlete. They, your kids in school, the pressure is, oh, he's an athlete, must be a cool guy. He's a musician. Oh, he must be a good guy. And you make more friends and you kind of get away. You don't struggle as much as you were if you just, you know, were a bookworm and you didn't, you know, whatever that thing is, music has allowed us to do that. So long answer, to a short question is um, I started feeling a little bit like people were noticing me when I was in junior high school because I could play an instrument mm -hmm. and that took a lot of weight off of me of peer pressure and stuff so I've always felt pretty secure in that and I would just encourage any kid that's that to find a passion whatever it is music or anything that makes them feel like that's what they're born to do and that's mm -hmm sometimes harder to do than to, you know, but to find that thing that gives you peace that, that, that you can live your life on. Like Ron and I, and most musicians, we're probably never going to retire because we love doing what we do. You know, if I was doing a job where I'm just going, man, I can't wait till I'm 55 and I can get out of this. So I would consider that a success, right? I mean, if you love what you do and you get paid for it and you like it, then that's a success. So that's, how I would call being famous. So I know I've kind of reworded the question and I hope that makes sense to, to them uh, that ask that, but I would be careful of that word famous and because it's not what you think it is and it could be dangerous. <laughs> yeah, I, I would agree with Matt. First of all, I, I, I don't think I've ever felt famous, quote unquote. You know, I, I, don't, I don't worry about going into the grocery store and having people recognize me, <laughs> I mean, which is, what really famous people deal with, you know, that they, like he, like he said, if Rick Springfield is sitting there, they get interrupted all the time. The only time that's ever happened to me is when I'm with a band, like where I was with Farner or, or whoever, and we're, and we're at a hotel or, or we're at a place where people know that that's us, but they wouldn't know me specifically necessarily if I happen to be walking out on the street, you know, whereas the, really famous people like when I was with Cher I remember one time we went uh, we, she wanted to go to the mall <laughs> and, and going to the mall was this giant operation you know going back down the back elevator of the hotel and they, she had her security people with the thing in their ear and they're, uh, <laughs> she's in the gap you know like yeah. it, it's like a whole thing you know like and it's it's like a little bit of a prison you know you, you know you a little bit. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, there's there's no uh, there's no bars, I guess, but but you know, you're kind of you're in that bubble, you know, which which we're not in. And I I also to a little bit to expand on what Matt was saying, I don't think I've always thought like shows like American Idol and that sort of thing that some people who go I'm not saying everybody, but some of the people who go into that type of thing have the wrong goal. And I, I don't think the goal is fame. I think fame is a byproduct of your love for what you do and getting really good at what you do. And if you if you happen to 
you know, if you're a singer in particular and you happen to have a great song that hits and, you know, connects with people, then then you become famous. But it shouldn't be that you're, you're trying to be famous, you know, like that should be a byproduct of what of the work you're doing because you love the work, you know. Well, That's, competition's pretty fierce these days. I don't know how often yeah, it would. Well, yeah, I, it's, could, it's I guess totally, it's totally different right. back in, you know, back in the 60s, 70s, even part, into the 80s. People like Elton and Cher and Steve Miller and all these people, they had multiple opportunities to, uh, you know, to make a record. And, and, you know, sometimes the records didn't do well, but they still got to make another one. And right. they also they also were pounding it on the road. You know, they were playing constantly hundreds of shows a year, building an audience, building a base, which is much harder to do now, especially if you don't have a hit, you know. So I, I think that, you know, the way that you get successful in the music business now has definitely changed if you're just trying to get started. Hmm. Yeah. Well, I had on here, I had a guy named David Duchovny on here and he told me he first felt famous when he met you, Ron. <laughs> Dave. It's funny. I just got an email from him a couple of months ago. Um, well, then don't tell him I'm making up a bunch of bullshit. He's going to, I don't know who that guy is. <laughs> but the no, story's I, good. And, and uh, tell, tell me about David Duchovny. Well, Dave... David and I met when we were probably 16 years old. We were both lifeguards together. Wow. Mm -hmm. Like at a pool or on the beach or? No, on the ocean. Nice. On, on Fire Island in, in a town called Ocean Beach. And uh, I That's lived- That's remind me of. David, David Hasselhoff. Totally David Hasselhoff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You can see me in a red bathing suit. <laughs> Actually, you don't want to see me in a bit in any bathing suit. But uh, no, Dave and I, um, we we're b both probably 16 years old and uh, we started working as lifeguards. I think he, he grew up in Manhattan. He went to a, a high school called Collegiate and one, huh. of his class, one of his classmates was John F. Kennedy Jr. And huh. I, remember him, I remember him telling me like they'd go out together and if they got in any kind of trouble, it was never a problem because the Secret Service would just step in. <laughs> you know so but yeah we we uh we lifeguarded together probably three or four years in the summer i think he i don't i guess he must have summered there i lived on long island right across the bay from there and the the head lifeguard of uh ocean beach was also like uh i forget what his title was he's like a guidance counselor or, or like a something at my high school that's how i got started work. so i used to take the ferry across the bay every day to to go be a lifeguard and that and David and I used to talk about music all the time. And, you know, of course, then he got famous as an actor, which, you know, we lost touch for a while. But then just recently, he emailed me out of the blue and just said, hey, man, I saw that you've been doing all this stuff. And, you know, congratulations. So that was nice. Nice to hear from that you. That is good. It's always good to read. And now, too. He does? Yeah. He's, yeah. I saw some YouTube clips of his, his band playing, you know, clubs or whatever. whatever right on. Good for him. He made a couple of records, actually. All right, so my friend Darren Pauschewitz, who Ron knows, and you've actually been on his podcast too, Matt, with your brother. Yeah. Uh, he had a question, and it is, do you know the solo still on the bottom line by David Lee Roth? <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't. And I, don't, I wouldn't even try because my thing when I got the gig, I mean, I've had to, I've had to take Billy Sheen's place and Stu Ham's place with Adriani. And those are two guys that are animals, you know, and they're just, they have a, it's like you were talking earlier on about a guy that, that does something original and you got to copy it. Right. It's like the hardest thing is to, to cop that. And um, I remember hearing uh, shy boy the first time when it came out and, and Greg brought the record home and we listened to it. And I was like, that's not a bass, man. That's, there's no way that's a bass. So yeah, it's a bass. I was like, okay, wow. That's amazing. So like when I first, got called for the gig, my first thought was, I can't do this because I, there's no way I'm gonna be able to do that. So the bottom line, when we play that song, we'd open up with that. And I would kind of whittle my way through it somehow and get some distortion and just try and do my version of what Billy would do. And it wasn't even close, but it goes by like that so fast that I would, but I do got a funny story. The first night I ever played with Dave, I remember praying and going, God, you gotta help me with this because I'm about to walk out there and these people are gonna hate me because I'm not Billy. And I just, you know, I hope this goes good. We're playing bottom line, the first show. 
the lights come on. I'm freaking out, just going, man, I'm in a circus. This is like, you know, you just get ADD all over the place. You're like freaking out. Lights are going crazy. Girls all over the place. And I'm looking at the crowd. We're playing bottom line. Just before the bass solo, I, this nunchuck comes flying at me out of the crowd. <laughs> it comes right at my head and it goes into my, right here on my strap because I'm wearing this leather jacket with this big strap. And it's going like, boing, 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 boing. I'm looking at it like this. I'm going, you got to be kidding me. Play the, blah, 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 the thing on bottom line, take the numb thing, throw it like this, play the song and go, God, you got to help me. And then- It was a metal? It was metal? It was a serious nunchuck with the star. Oh, dude, and, that's freaky. But, yeah, it was weird. It was the first, the first song. And then it never happened again. Nothing ever happened like that again. So yeah, I was pretty freaked, you know, having to fill Billy's sh shoes or filling Stu's shoes but both those guys are great guys and we you know friends and everything and talk and i would never ever want to think that i could do that because that's like a specialized thing and there's some things that maybe i don't know maybe i could do that they might struggle with a little bit but probably not but that's but those guys felt, that's the way i felt taking your brother's place in dave's band and smith's place in the storm is like these guys are monsters and in fact just today on facebook somebody said to me so I posted a picture of uh, from that time because Herbie Herbert was one of our managers. He just passed away. Yeah. And, uh, and somebody, you know, commented and said, oh, I came to see you guys. And I was expecting to see Steve Smith. And, you know, I'm waiting for it to go. And man, you really <laughs> sucked. <laughs> right. But luckily, the guy said, well, you know, you didn't disappoint. And, you know, was, I mean, it's right. it's a thing, you know, like, I mean, Steve Smith was huge in Journey and then you know so many other things and greg same thing you know and i just want i meant to say this earlier that one of the things about those guys and guys like that vinnie they know what to do in the right circumstance right like if they're playing right. if they're playing a, a rock song or a pop song they're not going to throw their unbelievable jazz chops into those songs because they know it's not appropriate and that's like musical maturity you know I anyway I think that that's something that that I talk about with Greg sometimes is um, is music vocabulary. Even though I couldn't play that stuff like Billy or like Stu on certain things, I could get close where like they someone would say, "Hey man, you hung in there with that. You did good. I didn't really notice it being terrible." That's <laughs> that's the thing that I feel like I can't. That's a goal. Don't I, can't, yeah, I can't. I can't play like Jocko. But if I did a gig where I had to kind of play like Jocko. I could get through it without looking like a total idiot. You know, yeah. that's that's what I think about learning a lot of different styles. Is you, I never said I'm going to be the greatest jazz upright player. I'm going to play like Niels Orsted Pedersen. You know, that's not going to happen. But I want to play a lot of upright and play jazz gigs and play fretless and, you know, pop on the bass and sing or do whatever. But I know since I'm not going to be the best at one particular thing, I can do well on all of them, you know. So I think yeah. that's kind of with you too, Ron. We, you know. Yeah. We can keep you working too, you know. You're not you're not stuck in a box of you're a guy who can only do this one. Yeah. Thing, you, know? yeah, you can't limit yourself with that. All right, here's one. I'm trying to figure out how to phrase it. So, Boss Gags, who you worked with, and uh, the song Lido. I thought it was Elton John for like my whole life until recently. <laughs> and, uh, they sound. They sound. There's a similar sound there, man. There's a similar sound. So do you think Boss Skaggs is a huge Elton John fan? I, I would hope, right? I would hope. I, You know what? The older I get, the more I realize everybody knows Elton in some way. Since I started in the band, I hear his songs more than in the stereo in the car or walking down the street. It's like, I, it's, it's like, I don't know whether I'm noticing it more or whatever, but it's amazing to me how many people are fans of his. So what, one of the things John said that was really nice was it was that he said, you know, the emotional attachment that fans have to his songs. Uh, they're so personal. Uh, he loves that. Uh, he, he loves that relation of hearing these fan stories of, <clears throat> you know, that song kept my marriage together or, or whatever have you. And there's such longevity to so many of these acts now that those are a lot of these stories and they're nice. You know, it's start. It's the fabric of of our cultures. It's cool. They got staying power. Yeah. yeah, a lot of that is the lyrical content and the story behind it, and just those two are a perfect combo for pulling off a song. I don't know if that would work for many other people, but it does for them. Totally. Speaking of Boz Skaggs, he, I don't know if you know this, but him and Steve Miller go back to when they were kids. They were in yeah, when they were that's kids. right. That's no, right. No way. Yeah, and, and I think Boz was in an early version of the Steve Miller band, too. 
Oh, no kidding. In the late 60s yeah. or something like that. Yeah. And what a cool guy, man. He's a, just, he was very nice when we, we, uh, we did a, a live CD that they're playing all over the place on YouTube and stuff. I see it all over the place. And, and uh, John Farrar was playing drums. Oh yeah. And uh, I mean, we just rehearsed for like a week and a half or whatever, went out there, did some gigs and they filmed this thing. And he was just, uh, it's weird when you're wearing the in-ears. The weirdest thing for me is when wearing in-ears and then hearing people that you've known your whole life, sing, like Jeff Lynn when, when I was doing the ELO thing, when you hear them sing, you just kind of go, wow. That, yeah, that, that's the moment that those are moments that I just go and they're in your ears I felt in that. Your ear. and you could yeah. swear you're back and in, back in Detroit with my record player with my headphones on with a tennis racket just pretending when I'm nine years old you know yeah. that just freaks me out I feel that way with Steve I felt that way with Lou Graham and uh, even yeah. with Dave too you know and it's sad because there's not that many left to ever have that feeling you know yeah do you think there's he's really there. retiring David Lee Roth or I hope not, man. I hope not. What an amazingly talented guy, man. It would, uh, you know, I don't know the whole story, but hopefully it's, uh, hopefully he'll go for many years. I hope so too. Hopefully it's fake news as they say. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it's a kiss thing where he's going to keep coming back for more. I don't know. <laughs> you cool cat. Well, I'm out of questions. If you guys have any other stories, you're welcome to tell them, but otherwise uh, I super appreciate your time. Oh, same here, man. I, if I had anything exciting, I'd tell you. I could make some stuff up. Sure. <laughs> I do. Uh, remember that time? No, uh, <laughs> one, one thing I do remember that made me feel really good about playing with somebody, because we were just talking about uh, Ron and I and other musicians have played with a lot of people that are famous, and we've got to watch them as they go up and down and see how they react to certain things. And that's a blessing to be able to sit, you know, to sit back and see Elton playing or see, you know, uh, Maynard Ferguson playing or whatever. But I remember one, one amazing thing that was a family thing for me was my mom and dad grew up listening to Maynard Ferguson since he was playing with G, uh, Stan Kenton, you know, in the fifties and stuff. And, and uh, when I got the gig and Greg and I both got the gig with Maynard, uh, it was like if, as if my son got the gig with Coldplay or got the gig with, uh, you know, whoever the biggest band is right now, you know, Justin Bieber or something. And I'd be hanging out with Justin Bieber. You know, my dad would come to the shows in his usual, usual fashion and became best friends with Maynard where they would, he would go right to his dressing room and just sit there and drink champagne. And my That's brother cool. and I would just be looking at that, just going, wow, music did that, you know, music made my dad just you know, go, man, I'm proud of my boys. You know, it was like, I mean, what, what reality is that? I mean, you know, it's, 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 it's a wonderful you thing about your dad. You know, I remember when I was in Dave's band, you know, Greg wasn't there. You weren't there. We played Detroit. Your dad came and he was on yeah. the list and he came backstage and he was hanging with Dave. You know, they were pals. And I was like, wow, yeah. this is awesome. You know, and I, of course I knew him from, from you guys, you know, I was yeah. like, what are you doing here? <laughs> it was great. He just showed up, huh? Yeah, well, I, well, I didn't know he was coming. But maybe Tug might have set it oh, up. Yeah, probably. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I, don't yeah know. I mean, that's, I mean, music opens a lot of doors for friendships and for things that we never realized. You know, probably half, probably most of the friends we all have are probably musicians in some way. You know, <laughs> well, you're, you're spending a lot of your time. Yeah. yeah. I just was, wanted to say something too about, you know, I know that you have a lot of crew guys and stuff that are on this. You know, we couldn't do this stuff without the crew guys that they're these guys are unbelievable the work they do and it's amazing and you know a lot of times on a lot of these tours i've hung out with the crew guys more you know as much if not more than the yeah, band guys. Man. me too man that's the thing i when i want to really feel normal and just get real i i get on the crew bus or i just hang out and and, and we go out to coffee before shows and you know a lot of the guys and they, it's kind of interesting. They always think that there's always that weird thing, right? It's like the crew and the band. And it's like, they're either, because the crew guys always start out being distant because they probably have said something and it's like, no, you can't talk to that guy, you know? And no, we don't that, want to get fired. Yeah, <laughs> so all they, don't talk yeah, to the boss. <laughs> I mean, yeah, but there's a point where it gets ridiculous where you just go, man, I need to hang out with you. You know, I need to get away not to blast musicians, but I need to be around guys that have totally different stories, you know, that aren't yeah. 
so much in common with what I'm doing right now. Some of my best buddies are the, are the crew guys, you know, and you're right, man, the, the, the show will not go on. And the way that they do their work and don't complain about it, are you yeah. kidding me, man? I mean, you, you know, many musicians like that. I don't, it's like, <laughs> it's like they just go and go and you just go, man, you just, you know, and the, and the sleep and the, the, what they do and the hours that they have, are you kidding me? Dave Amato and I became really good friends with a guy named Mike Garrigan and his nickname was Beef Boy. He was on Cher's crew. Okay. And he did all kinds of stuff, props and all this kind of stuff. But he was also a musician. And he was also one of the funniest guys I've ever met in my life. He was yeah. hilarious. Um, so there was one time we were doing a gig in Erie, Pennsylvania and Cher was coming and she was late and it was like a rainstorm. And so we went up on stage with Beef and he played. He, we just did a bunch of cover songs with, with him to cover some time, you know, to because the audience was like, she was like an hour late or something wow. like that. And then later on, he became Ario's, Ario Speedwagon's road manager. So he's working with Dave. And, and Dave and I actually made a record with him. Oh. He, he used to have a band when he was younger called Magic Ship. And we made a record with him and his partner, Tom Nicosi, who's uh, this amazing graphic designer. But they were in a band back in Brooklyn together. And you know, we made a roadie with beef. It was it was great. I got um, that beef cracked me up. He used to go out at the end of a tour, and uh, whoever the opening band was on the last song or so, he'd just walk out there and start taking all their gear off the stage. Oh <laughs> like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, while they're playing. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like, like the drummer's sitting there. He's got he's got a hi hat and a snare drum left and everything else. He's he just took it. Uh, he, he he cracked me up. That it, guy. Isn't it the case though, man? Most most of the roadies, most most of the tech guys can play as good as the band. A lot kind of them, of yeah. You know, it's like sometimes I hear our guys doing sound check and they're playing. I'm like going, I and I talk I talk to Rick uh, Salazar, our, our guitar tech and bass tech. Sure. And, oh, Rick. And, yeah, and I just say, hey, man, if I go down, there's the bass book because when I first got the gig, I had some guys write out every song, the bass parts, just you know for whatever reason. I know he could do it, even though he would say, I would never do that uh, out of respect. He'd go, I wouldn't do that. But I know if push came to shove, if I fell out of a building or something, he could probably come up and do it, you know? And, and Chris Sobchak, the drummer, is, uh, is, is uh, Nigel's tech. And he's actually played a couple of times. I was gonna say, I think he played a couple of shows I heard, yeah. Yeah, and I mean, it's just kind of, you know, there's not, that, there's not this big gap, you know? I reached out to Rick. I tried to get him on here. He didn't call me back. So bug Rick him. was on uh, Brian Adams' crew when I when I toured with the Storm, and he used to he was a big Greg Raleigh fan. He used to hang out with us, and he was a great guy. He helped yeah. me out. I got a really really rare Yamaha guitar, and um, you know he geeked out a little bit because it you know their guitar guys love their love their instruments or whatever. But uh, he got me in touch with the Yamaha people who told me all about the guitar. You know they only made like three of them or something, so it was. Uh, He's a cool guy. He's a nice dude, Rick. Great, man. He always has a way of making it work, you know? I mean, he... Dave Amato calls him Rick Salad Bar. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that's a good one. <laughs> yeah, he, he just, uh, he's seamless. I mean, those, that's, that's, you know, as a musician, you try and just blend in as if, like, when I got the gig with Elton, all, all I wanted to do was make their first couple gigs when Bob left, the other bass player left, it, just make it so that we could all get through this because you know Bob passed away and it was pretty traumatic for everybody. Yeah, so so uh, Bob died unexpectedly and it was kind of like they needed somebody in a couple of weeks and I just wanted to show up and play so that the show would go on and and just try and get everybody through it, you know, and try to make it seamless, you know, like Rick is the king of seamlessness. Rick Salazar, he's like Davy's guitar will go out and he just calmly walks out there. I mean. And Elton's like, what's going on? You know, going, you're freaking out. And he kind of, he doesn't panic. He just goes out there. Like if my bass is freaking out or something, he's kind of, you know, it's a different, it's like a, it's like an ER or something, man. He just comes out and fixes it. And it, it's usually done in a second. That freaks me out. Cause that's something I could never understand how to do. That's like going to Mars for me, man. You know, yeah. I just, I don't know anything about gear. I just kind of, know how to make certain things sound good or whatever but to know like if you bring up a guitar to these guys they can tell you the model number serial numbers that's like a whole other ball of wax for me man it's oh like, yeah oh, they're they're yeah. drinking the kool-aid 
<laughs> well, I remember, I remember playing catch, uh, playing football catch with with Bob's son, and I remember Bob was there, and, and Bob had all these uh, Rickenbacker bases. He he'd just have them all over the place, and, and I went to Bob's house just before he passed away, and he was watching me play catch with Jonathan. I remember Bob just looking like he was so proud of his son, you know, yeah. and. Uh, wasn't Bob a teacher at your high school or something? Yeah, I grew up I, I grew up in Detroit and Bob one day shows up at seven in the morning. He's the student he's the student band director now from the college. He had to do his residency or whatever at our high school. And I remember he came in reeking of pot. And it was like <laughs> he was like bearded guy, kind of a hippie. And it was like, this guy is cool. And he would, you know, we'd start getting talking about bass and stuff. So he gave me his fake ID. He gave me his ID when I was 16. I would go hear his band in the club and use his fake ID and, and just smoke, you know, get beer all the time and bring it across the border from Canada. I was Bob Birch, 23609 Lakeshire Drive for like wow. five years. And I looked like a little, little kid and I had this beard in the picture. I don't know how it worked, man, but it worked for like five years. So I was yeah. Jason Parker Moser. I know the address. Yeah. <laughs> and I uh, I was 5'10 with blue eyes, which was great. <laughs> it always worked. And the only time it didn't work was in Lake Havasu. And the guy at the door wouldn't let me in it because it was expired. Yeah. And you know who the guy was? It was Ron Jeremy, dude. He was the guy at the front door and he would not let me in. Ron Jeremy? Yeah, the porno act. I'm Ron Jeremy, yeah. He just getting a bunch of he got oh. a bunch of over there. He's in so much trouble. He is in so much trouble. Yeah, I don't know if he's ever gonna get fake ID. Now. What's that? When I was growing up, I didn't need a fake ID. They were no, man. You're gigantic. The age in New York was only 18. Oh yeah. And, and I was tall for my age, and the, the licenses didn't have pictures then. They were just these little cardboard things, you know. You could really? easily, it weren't even laminated. You could easily change a date with a pencil or something. You know, it was easy. <laughs> oh, man, what a crazy world. That just shows how old I am. I have a funny Billy Idol story. Oh, what a guy live like Billy Idol. I was rehearsing at Leeds one time with a singer named Tamara Champlin, who's Bill Champlin's wife. Okay. And uh, Leeds has three rehearsal rooms, like a small room, or at least it did then. A small room, a middle-sized room, and a big size room and in the other two rooms in the big room was van halen with sammy hagar and in the middle room billy idol was having auditions for drummers and so i walked out we took a break from rehearsal i walked outside and i see billy idol and sammy hagar talking and just laughing hysterically because this drummer who was auditioning for billy had just gone in there and he was all dressed he had like a suit on and everything and and he brought a spotlight to put on himself <laughs> during the audition <laughs> which billy idol thought was hysterical which it, it was great and, and we could hear him through the door he's a terrible drummer but he had this spotlight i guess he thought that by lighting himself it might help his chances of getting the gig or something <laughs> so, so he was telling sammy all about it i thought it was hysterical Thanks for watching. Don't forget to like and subscribe by clicking the round button on the bottom right. To learn more about me or the guests on the show, go to joelrody.com. You can follow us on Twitter, Instagram, or TikTok. The handle's Joel Rody. And don't forget, when you party like a rock star, don't be a dick. <laughs>